I suppose to start off with, I think there are three things, particularly if you live in, if you live in rural Ireland, that really make you. And one is your family, the other is your school, and the third is the GEA. And obviously the schools and the GEA are, are intermingled. And I've travelled the world, I've lived abroad for many years, and the one thing that has really fashioned me and my personality has been my membership of the GEA. It's a privilege, actually. It's only when you go abroad and you realise the wonderful organisation that it really is. And having lived in Pittsburgh for some of my time in the States, every summer, uh, Dan Rooney of the Pittsburgh Steelers and, and the Heinz Corporation would bring over kids from both communities. And it was amazing. It was the GEA club where the kids from, from both communities met on a regular basis. It's a unique organisation. And it's only when, we go, when, I, when you go abroad, you really appreciate that. So I'm going to talk this morning a little bit about health and wellness. And I suppose when we think about health, we think about diseases, uh, about stopping uh, the diseases that afflict humanity. But in fact, if we look at the World Health definition, or the World Health Organization's definition of health, it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. So if we take a look at well-being, well-being is really it's a, a multi uh, dimensional construct and all of these dimensions dimensions are related and really you can look at it as it can depict it as threads woven together to produce this larger integrated fabric and the overlap of these threads should be should should be to such an extent that they're almost indistinguishable uh, when you're looking at the lar at the larger picture and that's really what wellness is and when the GEA talk about wellness that's what it should be it's not just physical and mental it's emotional intellectual and social health as well. And I'm going to try and touch on each of those this morning. And when we talk about wellness in the GEA context, it's about wellness across the lifespan. We tend to think it's only about those who are playing. That's easy, they're playing. They're going to get tremendous benefits from their participation in, in, in our games. And they're going to start off at the other end of the continuum. I'm going to start off with the ageing. We all age. There's one thing for sure, we're all going to age. And basically, when we become very old, will be determined how we age and our quality of life as we age will be determined primarily what we did years before that. And for all of us, at some stage in our life, we're going to cross what's called the frailty threshold, where we're no longer independent. And when we cross that frailty threshold and increase our risk for dying, will depend on our lifestyle. And if you, on the x-axis here, you have if you can't see it here, it's your functional capacity, your fitness level, and on the x-axis the the is your age, and the y-axis is how fit you are. And basically, your fitness at, at, at 30 years of age or throughout life will determine where you cross that threshold. And you ask any individual any, over the age of 75, 80, and ask them, do they want to live long or, they, or do they want a high quality of life? They will tell you they want a quality of life. And it's the quality of life that's important. And I'm just going to give you one example. We have a program in DCU, and this is not to promote DCU in any way, but it was an, an initiative we started 10 years ago called MEDEX. And basically, MEDEX is a community-based chronic organ rehabilitation, re rehabilitative program. And the whole idea of this is to transform the lives of people with chronic illness through physical activity-based rehabilitation. And we look at the emotional, social, psychological, and physical health. All of these are important. It's under the directorship of Dr. Noel McCaffrey, who I'm delighted to say is also, his dad is from Scotstown, the same club as myself. He's, he's the father of the current footballer of the year, Jack. Noel's a sports medicine physician, and he's the medical director. And we get roughly 700 visits a week from the greater North Dublin community. Classes are on daytime, evening, and weekends. We get people from 40 years of age to 90 years of age who present with a host of chronic conditions. It's the largest program of its type in Europe. And it is having an enormous impact on these people who we would normally put out to pasture after the age of 65. It's having a phenomenal impact. We assess them, do simple tests to assess various indices of health and fitness, and then they undertake regular exercise classes, both along on their own and with our elite athletes in our elite gym in DCU. Now we initiated this program because we wanted to improve their physical health. But we found out after seven years, when we actually asked them why they were coming, the main reason they were coming to our, pro our program was for social reasons. It was, to, to be, it was the first time in the week that these people who lived alone got out of the house to be with others. So the social impact of this program has been phenomenal. And when we look at that interwoven thread 
of what we mean by wellness. This is hugely important. When we look at rural Ireland and urban Ireland and the amount of old people who are sitting in their homes during the day, I think our clubs sit idle for too long, for too many hours. And here's a wonderful initiative that could be incorporated into all of our GEA clubs throughout the country, whether retired nurses, retired physicians, sports science students, whatever the case may be, with a little bit of logic, we should be able to do this. Now, you wonder why the next one is up here. Believe it or not, we evolved from apes about two and a half to three million years ago. And when we developed the ability to walk on both feet, at that stage, we were able to hunt and gather. We were able to, to get away from, from, from prey and to get our own food. And because of that, we, our genes require us to be physically active. These are the Amazon Indians. They, they hunt for their food. They're always physically active. And our genes have required, require us to be physically active and remain, have remained unchanged for 10,000 years. And one of the most important things that a GEA club does, it provides the opportunity for people of all ages to be physically active. However, in too many instances, children in particular are not afforded that opportunity because of the competitive nature of our programs. And we're doing a huge disservice to those children because I believe primary prevention, stopping disease in the first place, is the most cost-effective way to run a health service. In many ways, our healthcare system is a disease-based model of healthcare. You get sick and you access our healthcare system. Try accessing the Irish healthcare system when you're healthy. It's impossible. You'll be on a waiting list for two years. We have to start at a health-based model of healthcare, and it's very important we start at a very early age. So for me, exercise is medicine. In fact, if we could prescribe a pill, it would be the most prescribed pill on, the plan on this planet, if we could prescribe it, because of all the wonderful things it does. When you walked in here today, just walking from your car to this stadium, every single, because of the, of the chemicals that are released by your muscles, every organ system in your body is activated in a positive way. There's no drug, there's no pharmacotherapy can do this. Exercise should be your drug of choice because it reduces our risk for a host of chronic conditions. And it's not that long ago we were very physically active. This is Ireland in my lifetime. I went to my first Ulster final in 1967, and the day before I went to the bog and took in turf with, a, with a, a local guy from the village, and we took it in on a donkey. That was 1967. That's the life many of us grew up, but things have changed dramatically. It's recommended that adults in Ireland get 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity per day. 25%, only 25% of, of our adults meet that minimum, minimum guideline. If we look at our children, our children used to play on the streets used to enjoy playing, it was fun, it was play for play purposes. Now, with the, with the technological revolution, and more recently the digital revolution, where kids have every single thing at their fingertip, we are engineering activity out of their lives. We're making it more difficult for a child to be physically active. And it's recommended that children get 60 minutes a day of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. In a study we completed a few years ago, we found that 12% of adolescents, that is one in eight, get the minimum, the minimum amount of physical activity per day. And if you look at another study we did when we looked at the BMI or the obesity level in kids, we found that on average, Irish kids between the ages of 10 and 18 are either overweight, or sorry, 22% are either overweight or obese. And the sad prognosis is if you're obese as a child, you're 90% chance you're going to be obese as an adult. I gave a talk yesterday to the Royal College of Physicians, to a group of physicians, and I told them, there is no cure for obesity. There's none. Once you're obese, you will be obese for the rest of your life. That's the reality of it. No diet works. There's no pharmacotherapy that works. The only cure for obesity, I told them, was preventing it. And, and that's the important role that GEA clubs do. And because of our physical inactivity, these are the diseases that affect Irish society. In fact, the vast majority of those diseases in this screen are preventable or can be delayed. And we are currently spending 70% of our healthcare budget treating these conditions that for the most part are preventable or can be delayed. Let me give you a simple example. The red there is the arteries. That's the coronary arteries that supply your brain, the blood flow to your brain. And that's what a healthy, that's what a healthy carotid artery, sorry, I said coronary, carotid artery. That's what a healthy carotid artery looks like. With poor diet and inactivity and a poor lifestyle, you develop fibro fatty plaque in that artery that supplies your brain. We can measure that using ultrasound imaging. And we can measure the thickness of the plaque in your carotid artery. We recently completed a study, one of my PhD students in DCU, she took three groups, a group of low fit, 
moderately fit and high fit individuals, and she measured the plaque in their carotid artery. And as you can see, the low fit individuals had much higher levels of plaque in their carotid artery compared to the moderate and high fit. 64% of the unfit kids were obese, 75% had a high blood pressure, 62% were insulin resistant, and 87% had a blood vessel that at the age of 50, between 55 and 60. These were transition year students in secondary school. These are Irish children. That's what our healthcare, we think our healthcare is burdened today. We have no idea what's coming. We, we can't sustain it at the moment. Kids are going to present, these kids are going to present, they, have, they don't have the risk factors for disease. These kids actually have the disease. We did another test to measure the function of the coronary arteries that supply their heart. And again, 67% had damaged coronary arteries supplying their heart. So at the tender age, and the other thing that we did find was that the higher your fitness level, the higher your VO2 max, the lower the amount of plaque in your coronary arteries. Now, that shouldn't be a big surprise. So when these kids, the clock is already ticking. At 15 years of age, they have already increased their risk for a stroke and for vascular dementia at 15 years of age. So we have to find ways to promote physical activity among our children. And when I go to a football pitch and I see 15 to 20 kids standing around being substitution, or I see a kid going to training on a Saturday morning and they're not being included, that's where the GEA is failing. We have a responsibility to ensure that every single child that walks through our gates gets the opportunity to be physically active. Because our current model that we have is that we're so focused on winning underage competitions, and that's what clubs use to define success. At the annual meeting, we talk about how the under-14 team did in the competition or the under-15 team. Instead of saying, how many kids got to participate and play meaningful games? How many kids got to train? What was the quality of the training? Secondly, we, the current selection criteria at underage tends to, it, appear, it appears to bias the selection towards the perceived best. Who are we to determine whether an 11, 12, 13 or 14 year old child is going to be a wonderful adult player? We don't know. If you do know, come and talk to me because we'll win the Nobel Prize together. And in many cases, what children perceive as early talent is basically just the advantages of being an early mature. And many of these talented kids who we perceive to be talented. A famous American coach called Woody Hayes said that humans are capable of far more than they realize. Each individual's performance is predicated, is predicated on what is expected of him or her. What you expect of a child, a 10-year-old child, can internalize what your perception is of them. If you say Johnny or Mary is slow, oh, they're, they're two left feet, they internalize that at a young age. And how, and our expectations of kids and young players will determine how we interact with them. We tend to give players who we perceive to be better more quality coaching, more effective feedback than we do for less talented kids. And if you want the proof, a study many years ago published in 1968, this was a phenomenal study. They took a group of kids and they took a novice teacher and they told the teacher before she went to the classroom that they had done an IQ test on all the kids. And there were six kids in the class who had an IQ that was through the roof. And then they videoed this novice teacher interacting with the class. What did she do? She spent most of her time interacting with those six children. And when they give an examination at the end of the course, those six children performed better in the test. Why? Because they got more attention from the teacher. All of those kids who we let go, who we think don't have the talent, and are let go at 13, 14 years of age, we have to find a way to be more inclusive and to ensure that they have the opportunity to play our games. This is a photograph that we took a former student of mine, Mickey Whelan, for his PhD. He went up to Monaghan, where all good football players come from. And <laughs> this was the famous Casablanca football team, under 14 team. And just to show you, look at the difference in that, the height and body shape of those kids. And if you take an under 14 team and you look at the, chain, the, the areas, the, the different stages of development a child can be in, on an under 14 team, you can have a child who could be in childhood, who could be going through the growth spurt, who could be going through puberty, or could be an adolescence. We treat them all the same. We shouldn't. We have to be more inclusive. So if I put this photograph up and ask you, which of these kids is going to become a star player? Well, the answer is, we don't know. 
In fact, long-term success in sport is dependent on many factors, and it's difficult to predict at an early age with any high degree of accuracy. So in fact, talent ID models have very low predictive values, and very importantly, there's no size, one size that fits all. We have to find ways to be inclusive. When we talk about success, the average GEA coach thinks this is success. Well, actually, success actually looks like this. It's a circuitous route. And in many ways, your job when you're dealing with children in your clubs is to ensure that, that when they're 18 or 20 or 25 years of age, they'll come back and they'll say to you, thanks for including me. I'm living a much more healthier life. I may not have been a star player, but you emboldened in me the importance of being physically active and the importance of health. That's, it's, that is just as important as winning the under 14 or 15 competition. And to show you how we don't know and how the impact you can have on a child, let me give you an example. This guy is a guy called Lazo Polzar. He was a psychologist from Czechoslovakia. And the comment he said was that children have extraordinary potential and it is up to society to unlock it. And we have that opportunity in GEA clubs. If I take our good friend Mozart, okay, one of the greatest musicians of all time. Mozart wrote his most, started to write his best music at around the age of 25. Mozart started playing the violin when he was two. His dad was the best violin teacher in the world at that stage. He had a six-year-old sister who taught him and, and trained with him. He was practicing 22 years before he wrote his first good piece. He didn't appear out of nowhere. People say, oh, this guy was phenomenal. He appeared out of the womb playing a violin. Well, he didn't appear out of the womb playing a violin. He had purposeful practice for 22 years. And as coaches, we have to provide our children with purposeful practice. Tiger Woods won, has won 15 ma major titles. Tiger Woods started playing golf when he was two. It was only after 20 years or 10,000 hours of purposeful practice. And I'm using the word purposeful practice because there's lots of ways we can present our games to our children. It was only after this time. His dad didn't say at six or seven, or, or, or Mozart's dad didn't say at six or seven, hey, you ain't going to make it, goodbye, I need another violinist here. No. We, he was afforded the opportunity to continue to play. And to show you one of the most amazing experiments I think ever done was done by good old Lazlar Pulsar. He married Carla, and before he married Carla, he told her that their kids were going to become the best in the world at something. He hadn't made up his mind what it was going to be. Okay? Because he said, but I'm going, to, I'm going to create an environment where my kids are going to be the best in the world. And he decided it was going to be chess. Because you could, you could, there was an objective way of assessing whether someone was a grandmaster or a world champion. So it couldn't be a team sport because it would be very subjective. So he picked an activity where you could objectively measure whether these individuals could be the best in the world. And how did he introduce chess to his kids? He took a large piece of wood and he chiseled out chess pieces and he put it in the same locker where he had the toys. So when the kids would take out the toys, they would take out the piece of the chessboard. And he had this big chessboard on the floor. And over time, he would put each of the pieces on the floor, and the kids would start to play with the chess. And all of a sudden, they started to play chess because they were intrinsically motivated. They wanted to play. And he started teaching. He knew nothing about chess, by the way. He never played chess in his life. He started to read books, taught his kids about chess. These are his three daughters today. And I'm going to just give you an example of the youngest daughter. Remember, he had never played chess. Judith, in 1988, became the world under 12 champion. In 1988, became the youngest male or female grandmaster in history at 15 years and four months. She's the world number one for 20 years. She's defeated the greatest male players in the world. She's considered the greatest female chess player of all time. There are so many chess players in our club, we're losing them. Because we are so caught up with winning at under 12 and under 14 and 15. You have the grand masters. You, they're in your club. You all know of the story of the great player who never played minor and then went on to win all Ireland's. They're in your clubs. We're letting them go too early. And in letting them go too early, it's having a tremendous deleterious effect on their health. We have a responsibility. So why do children participate in underage sport? Well, first of all, they want the competitive challenge. They want success. They want affiliation to meet friends. They want to learn more, new skills. But most importantly, they want to have fun. And that's where any discussion on underage sport could come, should come from. It's about having fun. We have to create an environment in our clubs where we're becoming so competitive 
But children want to play sport because primarily they want to have fun. Previous generation of Irish children spent considerable time playing games in the street and in the park. And this encouraged fun, improvisation, and in fact, it nurtured sporting expertise. This is what we did. It was unstructured play. You go to the slums of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Look at Kids will find a way to play. Go to any park anywhere in the world. There's no adults in any of these parks, but every single child is playing. There's no subs. Every child is getting the opportunity to play. If you look at previous generation of children, I love this photograph. We pay people now to teach kids to climb up ladders and to fall down ladders. Kids used to do it themselves. That's how they develop fundamental motor skills. Kids are supposed to break bones because bones heal very quickly in kids. That's genetically programmed. So kids are supposed to fall and get up. Okay? So we have found a way to engineer this out of kids. The majority of kids, when they played these games in previous generations, there was no adult involvement. Full participation was guaranteed. And what they did was, if the teams were not balanced, they would make sure, they would stop the game. Can you imagine a coach today and a Gaelic coach saying, we're far too strong, we'll give you our four best players? Not a chance. Okay? So we have to really think very, very differently as to how we affect change and how we allow our underage players to play. And in, and in many cases, the kids would even alter the playing area. Fred Rogers was the guy in Pittsburgh who developed Sesame Street. And he said that play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. In fact, I think a very important quote is that play is really the work of childhood. And if we don't ensure that our children in our clubs are getting that opportunity, every child, the grandmaster, remember in your clubs you have grandmasters who you may lose, who one day will walk up the steps of the Hogan stand and lift a major trophy. But you have let them go because we were too caught up in instant gratification. As coaches, it should be about deferred gratification. So I believe our job as clubs is to get children to adopt healthy behaviours at a young age. That's our role. And one of those behaviours is physical activity. We should also promote healthy nutrition. The, the likelihood of a child who's physically active and playing sport or them smoking is reduced dramatically or of them consuming alcohol is reduced dramatically. We have to find ways to get those kids. Let's take a look at smoking, cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking is analogous to putting a gun to your head. These are some of the chemicals. You have plutonium, phenol, you have a lighter fuel, rocket fuel, toilet cleaner, all in a cigarette smoke. And it affects every single organ system in your body. There is not a single organ system that it does not affect in a deleterious manner. And let me just start with one. Let me start with the mouth, because that's where it comes in from. We're not going to any of the other organs. And here's a simple example of the effect of tobacco on oral cancer. But children need to see that. But when you don't allow that child to play and the child leaves the club, I was, a friend of mine told me that he went to see a club in Dublin play very, very recently. And during the session, a fellow guy picked up his mobile phone, called a friend, the friend picked him up and he left because he wasn't involved. That child has probably lost the sport. We have a social responsibility. In fact, 82% of current smokers start before the age of 18 and virtually no one starts smoking after the age of 25. So we, do, we can affect their health behaviours for the rest of their life. When it comes to alcoholism, we have a huge problem in this country. We have a huge problem. But believe it or not, 40% of boys and girls who start drinking before the age of 14 will develop a dependency on alcohol, whereas only 10% of those who start after the age of 20 will develop a dependency. Again, we have that tremendous opportunity to provide an environment, a health-based environment. We're talking about healthy Ireland. This is what it should be. It should be our club, should be a healthy club where it promotes health. The same with drugs. The opportunity, the, the, the probability of a child, if you start taking drugs, you probably will become addicted and it will ruin your life. We have that opportunity again to provide a healthy environment. Mental health is a huge issue and the pressures the kids are under today is greater than ever before. And I was talking to a, to a, a, a colleague from Monaghan before I came in and we were talking about this. And it's amazing, if you get cancer, heart disease, any other affliction that affects any other organ, it's, oh God, love them, got cancer, going for radiotherapy. Well, the last time I looked, the brain was an organ as well. But it's got this connotation, and the word mental, whatever it is, it's an organ system. And the neurochemistry of the brain is not working properly when we have illnesses. But when we have an illness in the heart, we don't look the other way. We have to really engage and be more engaged. And, and to be fair, the GEA have really taken a lead in this on a national level. If we look at the effect of just brisk walking on remission from depression, 
If you walk 80 minutes a week, 26% of individuals who walk 80 minutes a week, not a day, get remission from depression and it's 41% of those who walk at least 180 minutes a day. That's very, very similar to drug and cognitive behavioral therapy combined. They're simple walking. My own club, Scottstown, on the training ground, have a walk around the ground now with lights. So at any time of the day or evening, anyone can go out, anyone in the community can go out and go for a walk. It's about a kilometer. That's what we should be doing with our clubs. Because when we go for that walk, it affects our brains in a very, very positive way. And because of the, of, 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 how we perceive stress, it also enhances coping and it enhances our positive affect. We feel good about it. And it also is very, very good in promoting learning. So there's, there's no downside to this. Also, many kids do suffer. And we, I even see it in DCU on a regular basis. The amount of Sigerson players who come to me year after year with, with issues related to mental health is phenomenal. And the point I want to make, you do not realize how important you are. I don't care who the child is, you've got to let them know if you're not there for them, their parents, their kids, you've got to talk to them. I tell every player, I don't have the same relationship with every player, but I tell them, I'm going to find someone. I want you talking to someone. Never have a child in your club feeling that they're ever alone. And don't take it for granted. It's the ones that you think, there's no way John could be depressed. John probably is the one that is depressed. It's not how they look. The players that come to my office, it just I fall off my chair when they leave because they're the last person that I would expect to see in my office complaining of depression. So it doesn't have an outward manifestation. So make sure you're very much aware of that. And I think it's important that the GEA, we develop a culture within our clubs, a culture that's very, very positive. And I believe the greatest coach of all time was a guy called John Wooden. He coached a team, a basketball team uh, in Los Angeles, uh, UCLA. And he talked about leadership and you in your communities and in your clubs. He said the most powerful leadership tool we have is our own personal example. And that's so important in your clubs. And he talked about integrity and about character. And he said, be more concerned with your character than your reputation. Because your character is what you really are, while your reputation is merely what others think of you. And it's character building is what GEA clubs should be about. You should be inspiring. Inspiring your club. I don't care what age the person is. If it's inspiring an 80-year-old to go out and walk again, or to do simple exercises in the gym in the club, or if it's inspiring a young kid, it makes a difference. I have three people in my life who've really inspired me. I went to Purdue University to do my master's. And in Purdue University, there's a building built for this man while he was still alive. And very few people get a, a building constructed for them when they're still alive. But in my estimation, he was probably the most iconic figure of the 21st century. Because on the 21st of July, 1969, he became the first man to walk on the moon, and he uttered those famous words. I had the opportunity of meeting Neil Armstrong on a number of occasions, and he just, being in his presence is phenomenal. And he told me the story the first time I met him about before he left to go on that mission to walk on the moon. And he told me about how he looked in his home before he left to go to Cape Canaveral. He was staying in a hotel with his wife, and he looked up and he saw the moon. And he said, the most amazing thing is when I look back four days later, this is, he told us what he saw. And that resonated with me. He said, the, the message from his, his, his talk with me was, there's nothing we can't achieve if we don't put our minds to it. Nothing. He says, I got a chance to look back on the planet. There's two and a half million years Homo sapiens have been on, the, on this planet. I was the first one to walk on the moon. There will be the first one to walk on Mars. There will be the first one in your club that will do something special. It's up to you to find and to nurture them. When I attended the University of Pittsburgh, I took biochemistry in this building here. And every day I walked out of the biochemistry, there was a lab right next to it. And it said on the plaque on the wall, this is the lab where Jonathan Salk discovered the polio vaccine. And I, I, just, I just said to myself, Jesus, this is phenomenal. And because of that, I did my postdoc in immunology because I wanted to find out about diseases. So you inspire people. And you'd be amazed at how you can be inspired. I was inspired into education, believe it or not, because one day a teacher said to me in school, Mina, you're the laziest lump. You're that lazy, you won't even get a job working with the Monaghan County Council. <laughs> and I said, you wee bollocks to myself, where do you see what I'm going to do? <laughs> but it, it ignited me. It ignited me. It's, it set a fuse off. It, set a, it was what I needed to hear. And I haven't stopped learning ever since. 
It's amazing the impact you can have on that little six-year-old who's looking up at you in your club. So I want to finish off talking about the other role that the GEA plays in wellness. I talked about intellectual. I gave a talk to the American Chamber of Commerce last year, and I took this from a website before it. This is what the American Chamber of Commerce said. Employers have long advocated the need for skill sets to be developed within students and employers at all levels with a focus on lifelong learning, the skills to interact with others, and the skills to get the work done. They're looking for adaptable. The 21st century, we're looking for a different type of employee. We're looking for people who can interact and have these soft skills because the jobs of the future and the skills of the future are going to be very, very different to the past. In fact, no one will stay in a job for more than five or six years. We have to be extremely adaptable. These are the skills that we're actually, these are the skills that we need. And I show you this photograph because I love showing it. This is the final whistle at the end of the 2015 Sigerson final. And what you see is the joy on the face of our students. But you know something, I call this the iceberg effect. This is the performance you see, but you don't see what's under the iceberg. All those transferable skills that those players received from their participation in playing in sport. And in fact, when you get your CEO, your Leaving Cert certificate, none of those are examined. And they're probably just as important as the cognitive knowledge that you're actually learning. And that's what employers are looking for. And I can tell you, being involved in a GEA club is giving our players all of those wonderful transferable skills by being involved. It's making a huge difference to their life, and it will make a huge difference to their life in the long term. Because it's not just about physical health, it's also about intellectual health and these transferable skills that are important. I'll give you one example, and I give this at, at the same talk. If you look at sport, Gaelic football or hurling or camogie, during a game, the relationship between a player and the situation is very dynamic, the same as the workplace. Skills are performed under conditions of unpredictable, constantly changing environment. We've got to make decisions all the time in the workplace. So basically, we have to our players in DCU or anywhere else have to be able to, be, to contextually process what's happening in the real world. So in DC, we don't do any drills. We play games because you have to make a decision every time you have the ball, and that's what games is about. It's about contextual processing. So what we want, we want players to be able to perceive what's happening around them, the same as you do in the workplace. We want them to be able to make a decision on that, and then we want them to act. Perception, action, coupling. No different to what happens in the workplace. They're getting it every day that they go out to play. So we want to empower players to take make contextual, contextual decisions that is based on spatial awareness and pattern recognition under pressure. How different is that to the workplace? It's the very same. In playing our games and affording individuals the opportunity to play our games at any level, they develop the understanding of team culture. And the workforce of the, the, workforce of the 21st, 20, excuse me, 21st century will be about working as part of a team. We're playing our games and making sure players play our games, it's about commitment. They understand the importance of being committed. And I love this slide here because these are two gladiators of the modern game, Paul Flynn and Michael Murphy. Now, if, if Michael Murphy could put a dagger on Paul Flynn's back and vice versa, they would do it. Those two guys, you can see it there, were inseparable in college. They're the two best friends. But when they crossed the white line, they learned about competition. You don't go palsy palsy when you cross the white line in Crow Park. It's cutthroat. But when the game's over, that's what sport teaches us. Sport also teaches us to embrace change. In the future world that our, these kids are growing up in, they're going to have to embrace change. Ask my 87-year-old dad. He's finding it difficult. Kids are going to have to embrace change. They're going to have to be adaptable. And they're going to have to be really, really, really adaptable in the future. Because you know what? In the future, robots are going to do a lot of the work that we're doing. Because, in fact, in the very near future, within the next 50 years, there'll be jobs that humans may, not, may need not apply for. That's the reality. So these soft skills that kids have, they're extremely important. Don't underestimate. And you're providing these skills by affording them the opportunity to play our games. That's intellectual wellness. The same as social wellness, same as mental wellness and physical wellness. It's very important. We're also affording them the opportunity to become problem solvers. And I love this quote from Brian Cody. I like to see play players making decisions individually and collectively because it shows me they are thinking like leaders. We want in this country to produce leaders. We talk about a knowledge economy. We talk about producing individuals who are going to be adaptive. We want to empower our children. And I think sport does that. I've been very, very, very fortunate that the last five winning All-Irelands have been captained by, by three students who've gone through the DCU Sigerson team. And I would hope 
that the DCU, their time in DCU, but also with their clubs have afforded them those leadership qualities. Michael Murphy, at 23 years of age, to walk out in front of 82,000 as captain of a team, what leadership qualities. Imagine taking that into the workplace. They're the type of people I would like to work with. And I know, obviously know all three personally. All three have unique leadership qualities. But we want that throughout all of our team and all of our players. And that's what sports provides our players, that wonderful opportunity to become leaders. And I suppose a poignant photograph, this is John Wooden coaching Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And it talks about, and our sport is very much like this as well. And i finish off with these two slides. This is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, one of the greatest players of all time. This is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with John Wooden a year before he died. That's what sport does. It engenders that friendship and loyalty. And that's the great thing about our association. And I'll finish off with one of my favourite photographs. This was the 2012, double or not many, I forget now, the 2012 or 13 All-Ireland final. Sorry, Mayo people down there. <laughs> and this is why I put this up. Johnny Cooper was playing in his first All-Ireland final. When the final whistle went, I remember the year, two years prior to that, I ran like a lunatic across the pitch. But Johnny Cooper had the presence of mind to walk the full length of the pitch and to walk and put his arm around Robert Henley because he had lived with Robert Henley for four years in college. They were friends. And that's the unique thing about our wonderful association. It's an amazing association. We don't appreciate how lucky we are. I think you don't appreciate how lucky you are to be empowered, to be in a position to be able to affect the lives of children, young adults and adults. We have that within our grasp. It's important that we use that very, very wisely. And I think we have been a role model. I think we have been a leader as an association. Everyone follows us, but that's wonderful. And I hope we continue to lead for many, many more years. Thank you very much.